Hey guys, I got a special guest here. He's a serial entrepreneur whose main business principles are making friends and having fun. Fenster is focused on disruptive startups with vertical integration and revenue driving innovation while cultivating and empowering top tier leadership teams to foster the growth of successful brands. And he's also the founder of Everbowl. Welcome, Jeff Fenster. Jeff, how are we doing today? Oh, we're doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so we're excited to have you here on the Clocked In podcast. Obviously, you've had several business ventures that have done very well. But Jeff, where for this, where does the story all start with you? You know, I, uh, I, I, I started. I'm, I'm kind of in a unique age generation because I was the last generation to go through high school. I think without smartphones and the internet and all of those things, but then got thrust into it right out of college, and uh, so it's kind of a weird time in the world if you think about the uh early 2000s and just where everything was going and um you know I went to my plan all along was to to be a sports agent and so I went to law school to be a sports agent and had a job lined up afterwards and was graduating um my third year of law school when I met my fiance and had a daughter and ultimately uh came to the conclusion I didn't want to travel around the world representing grown-ups and um live that lifestyle I wanted to be a more present dad so when I graduated law school I had no idea what I was going to do in life and um, kind of had a law degree, but I didn't want to practice law. I didn't want to be, a, I, I still wanted to be a sports agent, but I didn't want to have to pay the cost of what the amount of time it was going to take and the responsibilities that come with that lifestyle. Um, my family, the family life meant more to me. So I got a job, uh, you know, I did. I had law school loans and a family to uh, take care of. So I got a job at ADP selling payroll. And that's kind of where it all began. Uh, you just dropped a lot of stuff there. How did you, like, what was the realization? Because obviously you don't go to law school. It's not like you have people go and it's not really off a whim, but it's more of like, hey, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Like, so for you, my question is, what allowed you to like kind of change your trajectory? Because three years, a lot of money, it, yeah. it doesn't just, it's a big commitment. And to go, yeah, guys, I'm not really doing that. Like, I'm not, I'm not liking that. Well, well, I think what, yeah, I think I look at it differently. Uh, a lot of people look at, oh my God, I invested three years and six figures into this. I have to do it, but you're about to trade the next 30, 40 years of your life doing it. So what's the bigger cost, right? The three years or the 30 or 40. So if I wasn't going to, I didn't want to be a lawyer. I, I, I know that life and that wasn't one I wanted. And so if I wasn't going to be a sports agent, yeah, I have this degree and, and I'm educated in the field and I could always do it but I'm not going to do it. So it was never, a, it, it was a really easy. It was actually an easy decision. Um, you know, first time I had to travel and I realized how much travel was going to be required of me and how much time away from San Diego and my soon to be wife and daughter, it just, it just didn't pencil. It, it's just not, I just didn't feel like the up was, you know, the pros and cons, the, the pros did not weigh the, weigh the cons there. And so better to make the decision early than late. And so I just said, you know what, I'm not going to do it. And that was it. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Cause I actually got an accounting degree from the university of Tampa. And when I graduated, everyone was going to this big four, like go do that. Yeah. And I actually had the similar experience where I'm like, no, 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 I don't <laughs> want to do that. That sounds, that doesn't sound fun. That's not my forte. I'm not uh, enjoying that. So I, I completely understand. So you go to ADP, and what, how'd you do there? Did, were you, were you, did you do well? Did you just fit in? <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I have had a unique upbringing and um, kind of been surrounded by very successful people. Um, I always prided myself early on about the power of relationship capital and learning and networking and uh, mentorship. And so I had some incredible mentors growing up. I spent a lot of time interning at legitimate businesses while I was in high school. So I was exposed to uh, the professional world early um, where most of my peers were not. And so I think I had a pretty big leg up when I entered the, the workforce, especially with a law degree, um, a fiance, a daughter and six figures in law school loans. And I was working alongside college graduates who some of them had no debt and some had some college debt, but most of them didn't have a family. And most of them were still trying to go out Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, and still be a, in their early twenties. So um, I, 
I thrived. You know, I, I really hit the ground running and I attacked the problem from more of a macro view and, and figured out what I needed to do to be the number one sales rep in the country and um, worked backwards from there. And my first six months, I, uh, I was the number one sales rep at the company, first to make presence club and was a uh, sales rep of the month, my first five months on quota in the entire organization, all five months. And it was really a booming success. I, I made a ton of money and um, I was quickly being known with inside the company and, you know, I was getting uh, beautiful emails from corporate executives out of New Jersey that knew my name in San Diego. And it was kind of a, it was kind of fun. And I was literally not working as hard as you think I had to. Um, it was working smartly and putting in the effort, but I was also able to go to lunch anytime I wanted to and, you know, do the things I was. And so I thought this was my life. I was going to have a career here. Uh, it's a big company. And this was, you know, you got to remember this is 2007. So this was the word entrepreneur didn't exist. You know, it was business owners and employees and um, business owners used to usually worked in a company or a field for 20, 30 years, and then became a business owner or took over a family business. And um, you, you had people starting companies, but those were mavericks. You know, that was kind of looked at as very risky and uh, not endorsed in society as much. And it wasn't glorified yet on what we now think of as social media. And so um, I didn't have any of that influence telling me to start my own company. So it was really like, hey, I, I got a career now. I can, I can grow at ADP. The ceiling is, you know, very high. It's a, you know, it's a top 100 company in the world. Um, and I had a lot of room to grow. And so I thought it was great. And I bought a house, uh, you know, in February. My, me and my fiance moved into our house and um, it was good. Things were, things, were, yeah. things were humming until they weren't. Yeah, I love that. I mean, before we go past that, I think one thing that's really important that you brought up is that you had mentors and you had people providing you guidance, people beyond your years. So in high school, what were some of those experiences? It's not like you were going to work for them and making money. Was it, they were providing you with knowledge, right? Correct. Which, yeah. I always had a job. I worked at a place called Pazzo's Pizza in, in my little neighborhood and, you know, did the pizza game for two years while I was in high school. And um, that's how I made money. But this is the learning, not earning phase, you know, and um, one of my closest and my first mentor and, and basically my, my brother is uh, David Meltzer and, and, you know, Dave Meltzer now is uh, pretty, pretty well known in the space, but back then, you know, he had a few companies and, and I would show up and, and help. I mean, he had an interior door replacement company where he was selling doors and I would go help them do whatever necessary in the office and be their gopher. And, um, he had this company called Corporate Connections, where he, he had these retreats for corporate executives from all over the country. These big companies would fly in and I'd be there to get them coffee and, you know, be their caddy on the golf, on the golf range. And um, but I'm rubbing elbows and, and getting FaceTime with a lot of great people and a lot of movers and shakers and being exposed to the conversations they were having and, and eavesdropping and listening and, and just being a fly on the wall. And. Um, you know, those experiences along the way. And then Dave became the youngest CEO of a publicly traded company, PCE phone. And it was the very world's first smartphone before smartphones. And I got to work in that office and be exposed again to just the way offices work and corporate politics and business conversations that I didn't even understand half of what was being said. But the beauty is it, that was that got to be the first time I got to experience it rather than having to wait 10 years later when I'm an adult and I'm playing for real. Um, this isn't my first time. This is now my second, third, fourth, or whatever time. And just doing the, making that, that commitment to being a resource the best I could, even though I really didn't add a lot of real value uh, in exchange for the opportunity to, to learn and get exposure and um, build relationships with some amazing people. Did you lose me? Yeah, drop for a second, but I mean, we can always edit it out. Did you get, did it cut off where I was rambling? Uh, a little bit, but you're good. It was all about, uh, you were, we'll just kind of do a pause from there. You was uh, David Meltzer, where he was, um, he became CEO of the company, uh, the cell phone company. Yeah. All right. So I'll just start there. Yeah. And just kick it off. <laughs> you're good. Uh, yeah. So Dave became the CEO of uh, the world's first smartphone PCE phone. And I got to intern there and be in the office environment and again, get exposure to conversations that uh, 
you normally don't get exposed to it 17 and 16 and 17 and 18 and um, 19 and also be exposed to just the thinking that's going on and and it just allowed it to be not be my first time when I was playing for keeps years later you know so those yeah I, really I, powerful and I don't think people understand enough of the value in that um, and how valuable it can be to your career so having access to people who have done it before or are more importantly, having the right conversations, you know, people think of experience like, oh, I need to learn how to be an entrepreneur. So I'm going to go talk to an entrepreneur. I mean, that's fine. You're not going to learn anything that is going to be of real merit to you uh, on how to be an entrepreneur. It's really how to think, right. And how to problem solve and how to anticipate problems before they arise. And those are the key distinguishing factors between why I believe I could be successful in any company I start in any industry is not because I'm better than anyone else or even though I'm, or that I'm going to out necessarily outwork them, which I am, those are going to ensure a higher probability of success, but it's the ability to understand what problems you're solving with clear focus, understand what problems are on the horizon and avoid them. Right. And then understand how to think about problems. And to the point of kind of what we talked about pre-show about what your audience is looking for, you know, one of the key exercises I always do, and I, I recommend everyone start thinking about is, when you have a problem, it's not always running to solve the problem. And a silly, what I mean by that is, is sometimes solving something else erases that problem altogether. And a, a silly but easy to understand example of this would be if you come into the kitchen and there's gallons of water on the floor, in real life, you don't just start cleaning up the water. You find out where the water is coming from, you turn it off, and then you clean up the water. But in business, people quickly clean up the water, not realizing that it's the sink flooding. So until you start turn that off, you're just going to be mopping forever. So what is the problem? Well, the problem was the sink. Okay. So the question is, do I need a new sink? Maybe. Right. And that's where a lot of us stop in our business assessment in our, in our companies and what we're trying to accomplish. It's well, think about it step further. Where does the water enter the property? And maybe it's further out there. And maybe if we have a crack in this pipe or there's too much pressure, that might change this. Maybe it doesn't. Right. Point is, we need to assess the problem from a higher macro level and then identify what we need to do to fix it. And those are what entrepreneurship is. I mean, if you ask me to sum of entrepreneurship in, in the succinct way, it's a problem solver, right? If you're not, if once you've solved all the problems, you now have a pretty big business that is optimized and it's no longer like, you don't think of Tim Cook as an entrepreneur, you know, at Apple, right? He's the CEO of Apple. Um, yeah. Elon Musk is problem solving still. He's still that entrepreneur because he's coming up with new ventures and, and doing all this new stuff. So it's about problem solving and identifying those problems. And so getting really good at that as early as you can is the experience you should be after, not, oh, I want to learn how to flip houses. So I'm going to go spend some time with real estate guys, or I want to trade stocks. I'm going to go spend, there's a bigger part that's going on. It's the thought process, right? It's how they're identifying markets to flip and what are they understanding and seeing, not how to flip a house. That's the easy experience. That's the stuff that you can pick up off the street. That's why I jokingly say I don't need experience to enter any industry, right? I believe experience is the most overrated prerequisite to starting a company because it's not the experience. It's, it's what you're thinking about and how you're approaching the situation. And if any of my past successes can be attributed to something, I believe it's because I, I have a pretty good mental framework on how I approach these industries, what I'm thinking about. And I owe all that credit to the mentors and exposure to those conversations earlier on. Um, so earlier on in my career, I was able to be more proficient at those. And it's what I work for all the time. That, that's incredible. And I love the fact that you brought up, it's not about doing anything one certain way. It's not about becoming an expert. It's not about any of that. It's more about how do you approach these issues? And mm -hmm. the biggest issue that no one even knows about is the upcoming ones. For example, we saw COVID happen. Like right. this is, it, it's ridiculous. And it's very difficult to even think about these coming forward. But like, we all have to pivot in some sort of way. Like for me, the whole reason I had this podcast, I was telling you before that I wanted to get connected with these like-minded people and have exposure to them without spending their time and about without being like, Hey, let's set up an intro call. No one wants mm -hmm. to do an intro call nowadays. They want exposure. So, right. okay, I'll let you talk to my network. But at the same time, I'm still talking to you one-on-one. -on -one, and now 
it, that's how the dynamic works. It's a different way of thinking and it's a completely different frame. So exactly. I love that. And it's effective and it's effective, right? Because the truth yeah. is I've been on, I don't know, hundred podcasts of those hundred people. I don't think I would have met 85 of them if it was just an intro call. To yeah. Your point, right. Because there has to, we're all busy and it's all, we all, we, I don't care how wealthy you are or whatever. We all have the same amount of time. And so time is so valuable. And so that you've got to figure out, and that's the key to success is how do we maximize win-win situations with more and more people? And the win-win is you meet the people you want to meet. They get the win that they get exposure to your network and a group of people that may or may not know whatever products or services or companies they represent or their personal brand or whatever it is that they're promoting and everyone wins. And, and that's that right there is the ingredient to a lot of success. If you keep finding win-wins, you know, where everyone wins, it, it always works. Absolutely. Like, for example, my, my girlfriend, I was telling her how you're coming on the podcast and she's like, who is this guy? Like, what's he do? And I'm like, well, he's got this thing called Everbowl. They do like acais, they do smooth, like they do all this stuff. And she's like, I love this stuff. And I'm like, well, it's not in Tampa yet, but maybe he's coming that way, but it exposures to the East coast. It's completely, I, yeah, that's awesome. So let's fast forward. Where did you, so ADP happened, super successful. You want to stay there forever. You got the house, you got the leverage, you got the everything and you're still at ADP or are we? Yeah, sure. uh, so <laughs> I bought a house in February and March 1st, I had hit this very highly accelerated bonus in my comp plan, something that most people don't ever hit. And if you hit it, you hit it right before the end of the year. And the end of our year was um, June 30th, July 1st was the fiscal. And so I had earned it in January, but I, it, we get these reports like 45 days later. So your sales in January, you get this report basically the beginning of March that says, hey, this is how you did. So in March, I got identified that I'd earned a bonus in January. So I went to my boss and said, hey, it wasn't on my check. And they go, yeah, it's a, it's a fiscal bonus. You'll get it at the end of the year. You'll get it in July. And it was $17,000, um, which is a nice check when you're 23 years old with a kid and a house and law school debt. <laughs> and, uh, you want your 17 grand. And it was a lot more money back then than it is now. Um, and they told me I had to wait to the end of the year. And I had this moment of, of like panic, just the same feeling I kind of felt about my future. I, I saw this life that I was always just going to be sitting here waiting for some arbitrary amount of time to pass so I could take the next step up the the ladder of life, right? Of success of what I wanted. Instead of it being like how fast I can climb um, and how yeah. strong I can I can develop my skills, it was a third component which I had no control over, which was I have to wait a certain amount of time. And it just was too much. I, I went home and I kind of told my fiance, like, I want to basically threaten to quit if they don't give it to me and walk out. And she's like, what are you going to do then? And I was like, you know what? I'll just start my own company because I can sell this stuff. I'll, I'm good at it. I'll just start my yeah. own and I'll, I'll go after them. Kind of in a ego rant, if you will, not even like really meaning it but saying like, the words just came out, but you weren't processing what you were saying. Like I was just kind of like talking shit and venting, you know? And, um, and as a result of that, uh, she was like, well, that's what you want to do. I support you. And I was like, okay, okay. Uh, maybe this has some legs. And so then it was, well, we'll have to sell the house, right? We'll have to go move in with my parents and leave the house we just moved into and she was still like, yeah, you know, that's what you, what's going to make you happy. Let's do it. And so um, I went in to work and I threatened my manager, Ashley, to quit if they didn't give it to me. And she went higher up and it went higher up and it went higher up. And two days later, they came back and said, you can quit if you want to, but there's nothing we can do. You know, it's the court, this company's massive. Like you can't change policy for your little $17,000. So I think they wow. expected me to go back to work and I probably thought I was going to go back to work but I quit and I went home that night and we moved in with my my mom and dad and daughter and fiance or and um, sold the house and started my own payroll company out of my mom's kitchen with a buddy called iChex and that was kind of my jump into where this I kind love of entrepreneurship career I'm in now yeah I love it and that's the best part is that most people it, it's a force, like not a force, but I mean, they, they kind of like pivoted you of like, 
you saw yourself going down this line of a career that you never wanted. And you're like, I don't want to live this life. Mm -hmm. My whole reason that I didn't do this is because you guys paid me and I want to get paid when I'm supposed to get paid. So when you become the boss, you get paid when you're supposed to get paid and then you pay everyone else. Yeah. So I I, I like to, I like, I believe we should all be uh, driving our own car. Right. And so we should go as far as we choose to take ourselves. And if you are, professionally motivated and you care about a political you know a corporate career i don't want to be told well you know jeff even though you're more qualified or you achieved it you got to wait because you don't have enough years to hit this next milestone and it's like that's military you know that's um that's a different mindset that's just uh for me it's time is time shouldn't matter it should be skill based and and merit based right and if you achieve the results you should be able to go win the Super Bowl this year if you can. You shouldn't have to be like, well, sorry, you got to pay your dues and wait 10 years before you're eligible. That's, that's not a lifestyle that, that fits me. I, I can't do that. And so I yeah. had to leave. And I turned, I walked, trust me, my dad thought I was nice. crazy. My mom thought I was crazy. My friends thought I was crazy because I was making six figures a year working an easy job. And, but I, I just, won't trade again it's how you approach problems it's how you think further out you don't hit the first ceiling of positivity or negativity and make a decision you you've got to play out the whole thing and see the long game you know um there's a i'm not going to go into it because it's kind of long but there's a one of these old proverbs about we'll see and the power of we'll see and how things that you think are good end up bad and things that you think are bad end up good and you just don't always know right um yeah in the, in the moment, it takes years to see long-term effects and uh, the power of unintended consequences and um, good and bad. And, and so the better you can stop, uh, you can think more broadly and more macro and higher level for your life, it's your life. So I have to live. Yeah. And if I was going to feel like in prison, there's no better time than now, right? Yeah, we just moved into a house. And so that's the line when I'm you know speaking or I'm talking to entrepreneurs and I say, yeah, I know I want to start this, but I have I have two kids and I have a mortgage. So did I. <laughs> like, I get yeah. it. You, you either choose to do it or you choose not to do it. Both are going to be hard, right? So there's a, another thing trading on Instagram all the time This choose your heart, but it's true. You know, you choose which heart is better for you. Is the uh, allure of, of a little bit more short-term security and, and comfort better than, and long-term unhappiness better than short-term discomfort for long-term happiness and only only you can make that choice for yourself. But um, it's one of those great moments where you kind of get to test your morals and your values and see. And I know more about myself as a result of it that I, I literally will quit. <laughs> I did it. I, I love that because if you start thinking about it, like you were saying with the long-term view, okay, now Jeff, you've been there for 10 years at ADP. They're still not paying you. You're still upset. Now you're upset with your fiance. Like it just becomes so mm-hmm. many issues going on all at the same time. So I, I, I totally get that. Where did you get this long-term perspective? I think that's from more of the mentorship, you know, because yeah. I was able to see, um, I was able to kind of see just how things were. And I had a better understanding of the small startup companies just being exposed to some of them when I was younger, bigger corporations and just strategy, sports. Like I've always focused on learning. Um, I'm in sales, so sales requires more of a, or I was in sales, sales requires more of a long-term thought than short-term transaction. I was, I do relationship-based selling, so it's more of a long game, you know, and uh, I, I can't pinpoint exactly where it came from, but it's one of those things that if you don't think more abstractly and more macro on, on what you're working on, you should start. I mean, obviously, if your house is on fire, get out of the house, yeah. but, but start to plan, right, and Absolutely. It includes health and wellness. I mean, it truly starts with yourself. You know, uh, I'm, I'm a little surprised at how many people settle for so little for themselves and don't maximize their health, their well-being, both spiritually, emotionally, physically, etc. Relationships, professional. Um, life's way too short to to be unhappy, and you can always start over. And uh, there's so many amazing examples of of success stories of people of all walks of life, starting from the bottom, middle, top, who had to restart. You know, my mentor, Dave Meltzer, you know, who's literally my brother and he's the forward on my book. And 
Um, we're family. Our moms have been best friends for 35 years. He started over. He was a millionaire when I used to mentor with him and I was in high school. He's always nine years older than me and he lost it all and filed bankruptcy and had to rebuild his whole life at the age of 35 or 40 years old. And now he's back on top again. And um, it shows that if you have the right ingredients, or if you understand the recipe, you can find the right ingredients to, to make success. And so it's these things, it's, it's, it's how you approach these problems. And um, it's what will yield to con the highest probability of success and kind of ensuring it. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned a lot of stuff there. And I think <laughs> Sorry. some of the no, 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 it's good. It's good. I, I like it. And some of the big takes are living a life that you basically control and you you excel in every dynamic in regards to like you said mental physical uh community service philanthropy relationships spirituality and like the only way people can really excel in that is if they're measuring it mm -hmm. and if they're thinking about it and if they're it's top of mind but if we're just going like hey i hate my nine to five this sucks you're never going to be in that place of continued growth and um living a lot more so for you, obviously, you're into, uh, you got the coffee, you got the Ever, Ever Bowl. What is it about health and that, that you felt like you had to jump in and kind of go in that direction? Because obviously, you were out the, uh, doing the payroll. What, what was that transition? Well, so after uh, I sold payroll in 2011, um, I had a recruiting agency that I sold in 2012. And I vertically integrated those. And that's one of the, my business principles that has allowed my companies to thrive. Um, I got into digital marketing in 2012 and had an agency with Neil Patel that uh, got out of in 2015. And um, 2016 was the birth of Everbull. And the idea there is besides my family and besides business, my biggest passion is health and wellness and prevention of illness and being the best version of yourself and athletics and sports and um, eating real good food and the power of nutrition and what it does to prevent. And you, you look at what's really wrong in America. You know, most of the people who hate their job, it, it doesn't start at their job, right? And the reason they don't have the motivation to go do more is because they're not feeling good. They're not feeling good because they don't eat good and they don't take care of themselves, right? So it all starts with the fuel that we put in our body and how we tr treat our body because that's what takes us around this world. So it really starts with taking care of yourself. And when you look at America, heart disease, stroke, obesity, cancer, diabetes, hypertension, like all of these conditions that are so prevalent, and you can't go into a room with five people and not find three of them that are dealing with one of those conditions. You, re you realize and you learn that 80% of them are induced by us, meaning 80% of those conditions can be erased with lifestyle changes. And so my passion there is, well, if we know that, why aren't we doing it? And what the world could look like if everybody felt good every day and woke up not with an alarm clock feeling like they didn't sleep good, but woke up excited to charge the day. Um, imagine what kind of innovation could happen. Imagine what kind of amazing things would, would start to populate in society. And I, I know that's some big idealistic concept, but truthfully, I got to a position financially that I could focus more on my passions and less on paying bills. Yeah. And so, you know, when you get to that point, I want to create a better world for my family, myself and everyone else. And so it starts with that. And so you realize, well, if 80% of them can be avoided through lifestyle changes, movement and eating real food. Okay. So I know my problem. So which one do I want to attack? And I wanted to attack the eating one because you eat more often than you exercise and um, fast food is on every corner. And, you know, the average American eats fast food over three times a week. So it's like, well, okay, <laughs> let's turn the faucet off, right? Because we're mopping yeah. up all day with more pills and more, more all this other stuff that isn't solving the problem. It's just literally mopping up the floor, but more water just keeps coming. So going back to my stupid analogy at the beginning, it's let's turn the water off. And so the water is bad food. And in this example, and so Everbowl was created to uh, help make healthy eating more affordable, filling, delicious, and accessible for everybody. So that way you have options, right? Because if, if you don't, you know, those are the excuses. Uh, I, I identified yeah. what are the excuses people make to why they choose the fast and fried foods of like McDonald's, right? And it's, yeah. well, it tastes good. And eating a salad doesn't taste good. Or it costs too much to eat healthy. So I eat the, you know, the Big Mac meal for eight bucks. Or um, it doesn't fill me up. You know, I eat a salad, I'm still hungry. 
or I can't get it. I have 30 minutes for a lunch break and this is a little shopping center. I'm not packing my own lunch. So these are my choices. Like, okay, well, I know what my four excuses I have to solve are filling, delicious, affordable, and accessible. And so Everbowl was reverse engineered to basically build and address those four problems and provide delicious food that's affordable, filling, delicious, and accessible. And if we do that, well, now we've taken the excuses out. So now we've, we've gotten you part way there, right? You now yeah. it's available. You can, it's, you're going to like it. It's affordable and it's filling. So now it's just a question of your lifestyle. How do we get you more involved in it? And it starts with one, one, one bowl at a time. Right. And, um, that movement is what I'm, what I'm trying to push. And it's the unevolved lifestyle. It's a word that we created to kind of capture, uh, the healthy lifestyle, which is live an unevolved lifestyle. We've over evolved in society with technology and everything. So unevolve your lifestyle live actively and eat stuff that's been around forever. It's really simple. Move your body, eat real food. And Everbowl's tagline is made from stuff that's been around forever. And so at Everbowl, we're really trying to promote the unevolved lifestyle, one community at a time. And uh, we just opened our 47th location uh, last week in Dallas. And uh, we're opening in Knoxville, Tennessee in two weeks and um, Greenville, South Carolina in four weeks and another one in Knoxville. And we'll be at... Um, 53 stores by the end of the year and uh, we have another 200 under development so we're excited to open all across the rest of the country I and mean, we're in florida now just not in tampa yet uh but we opened in orlando at ucf and uh we have about 30 more stores coming to the state of florida and um we're going to push the ever the unevolved lifestyle through everbowl and have some fun and help people be a better version of themselves because when you eat good right if you just imagine this if you wake up and you eat good food your body's going to feel better. And if your body feels better, you're probably going to look a little better and you're going to have a little bit more confidence. So now you've already achieved three things that start the day great. And then you have the energy, you're sleeping better, you're not feeling sick, you're not taking pills with side effects. And now all of a sudden you realize you have more energy to do a little bit better at work if it is a job. And now you're getting rewarded because your coworkers and your bosses are saying, hey, you're doing a really good job and promotions start happening and you have a different vibe about you and a different energy and you're attracting more positivity around you, which brings more people, more opportunity. And all of a sudden your entire life changes because you changed your lifestyle. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it. And uh, as I've traveled around to different places, you see it. America, we eat too much. Mm -hmm. We always overeat. We have this issue. We've always had this issue. Um, so I love that unevolved tagline where it's just simple it down. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be on the phone. We don't need to be on calls all day. We don't need to do all that. Grab your Everbowl and yeah. just enjoy go and go on a walk. Yes. Yeah. Stand, Keep don't sit. Simple. Park for, yeah. I mean, there's so many easy ways, like little tricks, right? Because um, I'm, a, I'm a simplistic analogy guy, but yeah, you don't have to be like discouraged. The mistake people make is they're sitting on the couch. They don't exercise. They don't eat good. And they go, okay, tomorrow I'm going vegetarian and I'm going to run a marathon. <laughs> and it's like, well, that's not realistic, right? You can't go from nothing to, to that. So do baby steps, right? It's another life lesson that has worked really well for me to, to overcome challenges and, and do it is it's called win stacking, right? And, and what it means is the more wins you stack, the easier it becomes and the better you get at it. So set micro goals. And one of our core values at Everbowl is Kaizen to get 1% better every day. So that's so obtainable and doable. And here's an easy use if you're not exercising and you want to start is, okay, you've been watching TV, sitting on the couch for years and you're like, okay, I need to get healthy. Well, today, put on your gym clothes and watch TV. Sit. Tomorrow, put on your gym clothes and walk or run to the mailbox. The next yeah. day, put on your gym clothes and walk or run to the second mailbox. And every day, go one mailbox further. And two things will happen. Eventually, you'll just go further than one more mailbox because you can and you want to. And two, a year will go by and now you're running three, four, five miles a day and you've lost all this weight and you feel really good and you're healthy and now you have a active lifestyle built into your habits. And it started because you, you created micro goals that allowed you to win stack and build momentum and get the habit going without having some, oh my God, I have to go run three miles today and I've only done it <laughs> twice. Like, it's just such a bigger undertaking that you're going to end up failing on more often than not and so you're not allowing it's not that you can't do it and it's not that anyone else is better than you it's just that you need to create a again have a recipe for success that allows you to be successful and the ingredients will figure out 
just ignore the time frame, right? Like just set small micro positive goals that get you 1% closer to what you're trying to accomplish, a health and wellness lifestyle. Um, and you'll get there. It might take you a year, it might take you three years, or it might take you a month. But either way, that time's going to fly by anyway. So yeah. get that 1% better. And that, that applies to business, that applies to health. And so when you start win stacking, you gain confidence too, right? Now you're, I got to go 19 mailboxes today. I went 18 <laughs> yesterday, right? Like, but it, it's like, you've got it. I can do it. It's one more mailbox. It's literally one more house, right? Yeah. People can do that. That's obtainable. And then now you're like, you know what? I did 20 today. I'm going to go 25 because I'm feeling good. Great. Go 50. Go as many as you can. But that micro goal thing makes it to where you don't ever get discouraged and it's not something you can't accomplish. And so um, that's a recipe that yields success more often yeah. than, uh, than, than the others. Yeah. Yeah. I- it makes total sense because you're measuring and monitoring your mailboxes. You're doing something that's attainable. Like what I always tell people is uh, like there's Fitbit or the whoop or whatever it is, or like a hundred bucks you get them. And now it's like, did you do your hundred steps? Did you do your 10,000 steps? It, it does gives you a little ring thing. I'm not wearing it today because mine's charging and I feel like I'm missing out on the day. <laughs> right. You almost don't want to move till you get it. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, just because it's this conditioning that goes on with us that like, we get comfortable with this, we get comfortable with that. But like, once you can measure and really see how far you've gone, it's like, wow, like, I didn't think I could ever do that. It's, it's the same thing with pull ups. Like the first pull up you do is hard. But then you can start getting them, you build them. And now you're doing 2530. And everyone's like, wow, Jeff's the fittest guy ever. And it's like, no, I just did it every day. (laughs) That's right. It's the consistency of the action. That's exactly right. And, and obtainable, right? So it's just, and it goes same thing with eating. You know, if you're not used to eating healthier and you want to start replacing one snack, one, one, take two bites, say, you know what? All right, I'm going to eat two bites of this. Like I used to hate onions and my wife used to call me out on it. She's like, you know, you always tell me I should try things and you hate onions. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to like onions now. So it was like challenge <laughs> accepted. So I started and I took a bite of onions. I'd swallow it. And then the next night I'd like, make me an onion. And I just would eat it every day. Just one bite, one <laughs> bite, two bites, three bites. Now I can, I love onions. I love onions. Like I just can eat them. I train myself to like, you can train yourself to like things you can train. And, and then, and that's what happens. Like in my teens, I didn't eat many vegetables, you know? Um, now I eat a lot of them because I realize the power that they have, you know, it's truly nature's medicine. It prevents and cures so many things. So eat more of them. And when you don't yeah. get more of them, you're making the decision that you don't care about your health, the insides and the outsides and all this. And so, um, you know, I think success starts with self-preparation, being prepared for success. Like the greats at anything, if you look at sports or business, they don't show up and do a good job. They did a good job and were set up for success before they ever showed up. Uh, they were yeah. prepared to be successful, you know? Um, and so it's the, the recipe is the same for, for most of those successful people. Their style is different, but the core pieces, the foundational recipe and pieces are the same. And, um, you know, I don't need to be smarter than everyone else. I just need to copy smart people and do and be around smart people and smart things happen. Right. And so, um, same thing, right. Just start understanding and identifying what successful people do and why, and do more of that. And that's what, that's what it is. I mean, there's a direct correlation for most, you know, a lot of success starts with feeling good because if you don't feel good, you're not going to perform good and you're not going to perform good if you don't feel good. So um, it's hard, you know, when you're sick and not feeling good, it's really hard to be your best. Yeah. And also to that point, um, if you are not investing that little 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour every day to that bettering uh, physique, whether that's going on a walk, run, whatever that is, going to the gym, then you're going to pay for it down the line when you're not feeling well. And you're like, I wish I, I wish I got better. I wish I did this. And it, it's sad, but it happens to a lot of people, especially in America, like you're saying that if we can focus on this, because this is the broken pipe. <laughs> it's not the water on the ground where you're like, there's an extra right. five pounds. It's the mindset of what you think about when you think of, I want to work out. I want to enjoy this. And it's really a pain or pleasure thing that a lot of people don't realize the they'd rather sit in the, in the, 
and the pain of like, Hey, like, I don't feel that good, but it's not a big deal. Then the pleasure of, I feel like, I feel amazing mm-hmm. right now. I, I see it. You, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. I do. I do. And, and the, the excuse you'll hear is time. I don't have time for it. And I'll first argue you don't have time not to, but because you're yeah. going to lose so many years of life if you don't take care of yourself that you're trading more time. Um, yeah. But you always have time. You can choose to park as far away from the grocery store as possible and walk those extra 100 yards in the parking lot because you have to go to the grocery store and you don't have time to work out. That's fine. So find, find your workouts, right? It's when you're on the phone call in your office, don't sit at the chair, stand, do wall sits, do air squats, yeah. take the stairs instead of the elevator up your building. When you go to lunch, yeah. take the stairs down. Decide to walk all the way around the building before you walk in. It takes an extra 18 seconds, but those 18 seconds done 20 times a day adds up. And now you just spent 10 minutes working out, right? It just wasn't all at one time. So you find the time if, it, if it's, if you're not, the, the, I don't, I don't do well with excuses. <laughs> I don't, my, kids, no, I, my, kids I me, my, my oldest, she's 15. And um, I always have this saying, I always tell her, she gives me an excuse. I'm like, excuses don't pay the bills because they just don't right excuses are, are just nonsense like either you do it or you don't do it and if you can't figure out how to incorporate it then it's a thinking problem you just got to identify how do i solve the problem i, I want to get healthy yeah. and i don't have time find find it right you have you have 24 hours in a day you're not strapped to a chair 24 hours a day so right now like on this podcast if i didn't have time and i, I stood up and i was just squatting <laughs> instead i'm i'm being active right I'm yeah. doing things and you know we have stand-up desks in my office so like this desk I can stand if we, <laughs> as we do this if I want to I love it right um but that's the same premise is you find a a a way to be active and yeah and and you commit and just do micro again micro goals like you don't have time to take the stairs instead of the elevator of course you I, do it, so and we're lit I, I just want to note, guys, like everyone listening, this is a guy who's probably busier than 95% of the people <laughs> listening. He's traveling. He's got the businesses. He's got so much going on. And he's finding ways for all this to happen. Like, it, it, it can't be understated that. And, but that's also someone in motion, stays in motion. And you're obviously a guy mm-hmm. in motion. You're making it happen. Um, well, you, but, you build the habit and then you can't do without. Now, it's yeah. it's it's almost weird that, like I don't take escalators. I always take the stairs. <laughs> I like, love you it. Go at the airport, airport, you got your bag and I'm carrying really luggage. <laughs> I'm the stair guy because it's such an yeah. easy way for for me to get twenty seconds of 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 activity happening. Right, the stairs are there. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. literally there. So yeah, I think uh, another big thing is uh, setting that example for it. Like we haven't really dove into it, and I know we're coming to an end. But the relationship with your uh, kids and your wife, like you have to set that example. You can't go read your book and you don't read a book. You can't go work out and you don't work out. Like that's right. It's so hypocritical, and that's the best relationships when they go, Dad, you're you're not. Do- no, no, I am doing it. Do you want to come with me? You, we could see it all day. I'm doing it. Like you, you know who I am, and that it, it sets a great example for everyone. So what, what do you feel about all that? And like, where are some of the ways that allow you to have great relationships in your life? Um, I, you know, I think it's just saying it's built on the concept of win-win and yeah. leading with value and understanding that uh, the more connections you have, the more opportunities you have in, in all things. I mean, there's only so many people in the world that you actually have a real relationship with out of, you know, seven, eight billion people. So uh, valuing those and, and understanding it and committing to to the core tenets of, of a healthy one you know honesty and transparency and all that stuff and and pushing each other right I mean I don't let my my group settle for less than themselves yeah. uh, I, I don't tolerate it for myself or my family and if you're my family you you can do better and yeah. call me out when I can do better and it's good right you should the conversations are better and yeah it's a it's a better journey through it you know positivity yeah. and and um growth a growth mindset you know and then you attract more growth mindset people kind of like what we talked about pre-show you know just the people you're around do cooler things you're going to do cooler things and if the people you're around are are 
not, then unfortunately you you have walls you're going to have to break down because you're going to have these influences that are pulling you in the wrong direction. And so it starts again with taking care of yourself. And when you start taking care of yourself and meaning you just care that you have the energy and you have a positive mindset and you're growing and you're going to start attracting people that that's attracted, right? I, yeah. I can quickly tell if someone's a growth mindset or not. And if you're a growth mindset, I naturally want to have conversations with you. I want to talk to you on the airplane. I want to have lunch. I want to, I want to pick, pick your mind and have you pick mine and have good, deep, rich, enriching conversations. And if you're not, it's like, how fast can I get out of here? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. It's completely different. And it's, um, it's super interesting uh, going around life like that, because when you're able to have these conversations with people and they're like, I want this, I want this, I want to do this. And they're actually taking action steps. You're like, dude, let's make it happen. Like, what do I need to do to help? Like, I want, I want, I've, I've been there. I want to see this on the journey. I love it. Mm -hmm. So Jeff, for you, Everbowl coming around the country, it's going everywhere. What, what do you want? Like, what's the lasting impact you want to have with it? And then what, what do you want to leave the audience with? Uh, so, you know, our goal at Everbowl is to be in every community um, and make health and wellness and an unevolved opportunity option available and an opportunity for everyone to, you know, have access to it. Um, there's obviously a business side to it. We franchise now. And so we're also empowering business owners and uh, aspiring business owners to join the Everbowl family and, and join us and open locations and grow. And so that's been rewarding because now I get to work with entrepreneurs all around the country who are growing the Everbowl brand and building financial stability for themselves and doing the same things that we're doing. And it's, it's cool because the family's growing. Um, and obviously, you know, it's still a business. So at the end of the day, you know, I take pride in the fact that we've employed, you know, 500,000 people um, and we're, it's growing every day. And uh, we're, we're the first and second and third job for so many young adults. And we're teaching them how to enter the workforce in, in a way that um, is going to hopefully yield them a whole lifelong bit of success. And we're doing it in a way that is also, I'm very proud of to, to be a part of, you know, we're not selling cigarettes or fast and fried food or any of that stuff. You know, every customer who comes to Everbowl is actually better when they leave and they made a good choice. And so uh, we get to stand on the right side of history and do all these fun things. And so for me, it's, it's growing the Everbowl brand. It's, it's seeing how big we can take this and um, being a part of the communities that we enter and, you know, having a whole lot of fun and making some friends along the way. I love it. I love it. And where can people find you? Uh, obviously social media. So at Everbowl Craft Superfood is uh, Everbowl's Instagram, Everbowl Craft Superfood. And then mine is Fenster Jeff, last name, first name. And easy to get a hold of and always talk shop. And if you ever go to an Everbowl, obviously hit me up. Let me know what, uh, what, you, what you think of it. I love it, Jeff. I really appreciate it, man. This is awesome. Yeah, of course. Thank you.